This sermon is titled My Mind Part 4 Controlling your thoughts training your thinking be enriched as you listen We've been doing this series on my mind we've called the series My Mind uh, basically addressing the challenges almost all of us face in our mind, in the area of our mind, addressing it from the Word of God. What does the Bible have to say concerning these things? And, you know, the whole aspect of mental health is such a big thing in our world today, uh, especially as uh, the world has transitioned out of the pandemic or journey through it. It's become such a big topic, such an important part of our lives, and we need to address that. But what we're doing is addressing it from a biblical perspective. What does the Bible say about these things? So this is the fourth message in this series. Uh, in case you've missed the previous three, you can go to our church website, uh, listen to the earlier messages. Uh, they're all available there. I want to quickly review a few things. Uh, you know, in part one, we talked about the mind, imagination, and mental health, or just more of an introductory message. Uh, we, you know, we looked at First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, where uh, Paul told us, he wrote that the God of peace himself will sanctify you entirely. So God wants to sanctify, make us holy completely in all aspects of our being. And he said, in your spirit, and soul and body. All three aspects, spirit, soul, and body. God is working to sanctify us and to keep us complete. So we made this statement, you know, God is working to keep us holy and whole, especially in the area of our soul. That's our primary focus. So God is working in you and me to keep us holy and whole in the area of our soul, which is our mind, our will, our emotions. God is at work, in, at work in us. So we made this statement, the God of peace himself desires to work in me so that my thinking, reasoning, intelligence, emotions, imaginations, and memory can be made holy and kept whole, sound, and in good health. We also mentioned, uh, this is based on 2 Timothy 1.7, about a sound mind, that the Holy Spirit empowers us with a sound, disciplined, and self-controlled mind that has sound understanding, a sound concentration, and a sound memory. In part two, we address the topic of concentration, distractions, wandering, that whole area. And one of the things we pointed us to was biblical meditation that God teaches us to meditate in His Word. And we outline the process of meditation from Proverbs 4, 20 to 22, and I'm just quickly reviewing in these five words. We said attention, that is, we focus on the Word. There is inclination, that is, we cut out all distractions and lean over to God's Word. Visualization, we imagine what the Word of God uh, is, is, is describing. We see that Word happening, fulfilled in our lives. Assimilation, that is, you imbibe the Word. You make it part of yourself. Um, confession, is you say what the Word says. In part three, the previous message, we talked about temptations, addictions, and deceptions, how that happens. How does temptation work? How does the enemy use thoughts and ideas and imaginations to tempt us? We address that. And uh, uh, I can't try to attempt, attempt it to summarize that message in using the word safe as an acronym. We said, keep your mind safe. Uh, S, to speak the word. A, to act al aligned to the word. F, to focus on the word. And E, to examine ideas, taking the word of God into account. Now, that's just a quick review and you can, you know, of course, listen to the messages. Today, I want to talk about controlling our thoughts and training our thinking. Controlling our thoughts and training our thinking. I want to just begin with a personal story. Uh, so this is almost 40 plus years ago. Uh, it was October of 1981. I was just just before my 13th birthday, I was a student here uh, in Bishop Cotton Boys School. That's when the Lord Jesus touched my life. And then shortly after that, uh, the following year, this is uh, early part of 1982, uh, that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to pray in tongues, and I've been praying in tongues ever since. But it's a wonderful experience. And from then on, the journey began of uh, just uh, you know, receiving revelation and insight into the Word of God. 
And so this is a wonderful time of growth. But then something happened in the early part of 1983, between January to April of 1983. So I was in my ninth grade here in school. And um, during that time, those four months, suddenly, you know, now, I just want to give you an idea. During, in those early days, my daily routine was 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. was my time with God. So every day, 4 to 7, I would spend time with God, then go to school. So I'd spend about an hour or so praying in tongues, an hour or so in the Word of God. That was my normal day. And if my dad was here, he will attest to that. I'm not lying, right? Um, but that was my normal routine. And I was just spending time with God, just learning so much from the Word, and then enjoying school and trying to get as many people saved in school. And, you know, that was, that was, that was what was happening. But then in the early part of 83, 1983, January to April, something strange happened. I, I was not able to concentrate. You know, I was sitting in class. I wanted, to, I wanted to listen, but my mind was just being so distracted. All kinds of thoughts seemed to just fill my mind. And uh, my, even my prayer time would be disturbed. I want to pray. I want to, you know, I am fully committed to praying, but I would be distracted. My mind is being disturbed by unwanted thoughts. And it was not that I wanted to distract myself. If you ask me, I didn't want these distracting, disturbing thoughts. I didn't want it. But it was just coming, and I didn't know what to do. You see? And um, so then I began to pray. I began to ask God, God, please help me. You know, and I didn't know. There was, I I didn't know whom to go to ask. You know, those days we didn't have uh, mentors and all of those kinds of things, people we have today. But so I just began to pray, and, and God in His goodness and mercy... Help me understand certain things. So it was during those days, back, we are going back almost 40 years, nine, uh, early part, January, April, 1983, that I began to learn that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God gave me a sound mind. That means I have a sound memory, a sound concentration, sound understanding. I understood from Philippians 4, 8, that when God says, think on these things, that means my mind is mine. I am in control of my mind. I can choose to think on what I want to think. I learned from 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, how to take control of those thoughts in the mind. Uh, I have learned about renewing of the mind from Romans 12, 2. I'll share, with us that, uh, share that with us next Sunday. And, and so all of these things, just my eyes begin to open, and I took these things. I took what I was learning and began to apply it to my life. Began to put in action. And then surely by the middle of that year, by July of that year, my mind was clear. I was able to have a clear mind. I was able to think clearly. I was able to concentrate, focus, and so on. And ever since that time, I've been applying these truths in life. So, whatever I'm sharing with you, and of course, over time, you begin to learn more. You continue studying, experiencing, you begin to learn more, of course. But the point I want to get across is, whatever we are sharing with you in these sermon series, it's not just theory we came up. It's something I can say in my own life. I've lived almost 40 years. And it has worked in every situation gone through various life situations, various situations, and everything we're sharing with you has worked. God's Word works. Amen? So we're not sharing with you something that, you know, just try it out, figure it out. No. I can tell you God's Word works. This is truth. You can live by it. You can give your whole life to it, and it'll cause you to succeed. Amen? So today, we're going to talk about Controlling our thoughts. Let's begin with Philippians 4.8. And how do we train our thinking? Philippians 4.8, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things or think on these kinds of things. Now, all of us reading this verse will say, hey, that's exactly what I want. I want to do that. I want to think on things that are good and pure and lovely and praiseworthy. and oh, That's exactly what I want. But the problem is, how do I do it? Because we all have, we face challenges. We, are, you know, we get all kinds of thoughts, 
unnecessary thoughts, thoughts that we don't want, disturbing our mind. So while we affirm Philippians 4, 8 and say, yeah, that's exactly what I want. How do I get there? How do I do that? How do I make it happen for myself? And so this is where I want us now to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, where we need to understand the whole process. And the Apostle Paul writes this for us. Let's read it. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. For he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So, over here, the Apostle Paul is, uh, is outlining for us what to do in the area of our mind. And uh, he, he starts from the worst case scenario, that is the strongholds, and he works backwards. So let's put it in, 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 the, in the order, right order of progression, starting from verse 5 up back to verse 3. So what happens? There's a thought. A thought, and if it's a wrong, a wrong thought, if it's not, he says, we got to bring every thought captive. It's not taken captive. The thought progresses into an argument or a reasoning in our minds against the truth. So if it's a wrong thought, it's going to develop into a reasoning, an argument in your mind, in our minds, against the knowledge of God, against God himself. And if that arg argument or reasoning is not stopped there, it progresses into an imagination. Now you begin to see that happening in your life. You see it as though it's a, it's, it's a real thing. It's, it's almost real, except that it's happening in the mind, in the imagination. And if that imagination is not stopped, and if that continues to work in our minds, and additional thoughts and ideas are accumulated, it becomes a stronghold. A stronghold is simply a fortified area. It's a fort. It's an area of our mind where this wrong thought, this wrong idea has now taken over. A, a, a stronghold is a fort built with, built with thoughts and ideas and reasonings. The enemy has taken that area of our mind over. And sometimes, in some cases, it can, it can be, become a place of uh, the influence of unclean spirits and so on, and deliverance is needed. A thought becomes an argument becomes an imagination, becomes a stronghold. Are you with me so far? So the good news is, Paul says, that we've got weapons that God has given to us by which we can take every thought captive. The moment the thought comes, you can take it captive. Or we can cast down arguments and imaginations. Cast down means to demolish. So even if it progresses from a thought to becoming an argument, a reasoning, you can demolish it. Or it has become an imagination, you can still demolish it. Or in some cases, if it has progressed to the point of becoming a stronghold in our minds, we can pull it down, if we can, with the weapons that God has given to us. And we need to learn how to do this. That's the good news. And so our minds can be cleared of all of these things. So, there is, I want us to understand how this progresses. We can, you know, based on observation, we can describe this dangerous progression in this manner. A deception could lead to depression. A deception is a wrong thought, a deceiving thought. Example. For some reason, somebody says, you're good for nothing. You know, that thought comes. It's a deceiving thought. It's a wrong thought. But if you don't stop that, that you know, it works in your mind, and then you can end up becoming depressed. I'm good for nothing. Wake up in the morning, I'm good for nothing. Depressed. A deception has led to depression. It's affected your behavior. And this is one example. You can think of so many different scenarios. A, a wrong thought, a deception has led to depression. 
Now the point is, Satan's primary job is deception. He deceives the nations, the Bible says. So not only, does he can, not only can the devil deceive an individual, he can deceive a community, he can deceive nations, millions of people deceived, coming under one same wrong thought, all of them. So don't think the majority is right. The majority could be deceived. It's in the Bible, because Satan deceives nations. So don't just look at the numbers. You have to evaluate a thought for, the, for its own validity. But the point is this. A thought, a deceiving thought could lead a person into depression. And if, they, if it doesn't stop that, the enemy uses that occasion, that moment of weakness of depression, to then begin to oppress. That means to exert force. So now the person feels heavily depressed. There's oppression. There's a demonic influence on that person in that state. So there's oppression. And if that's not checked, that can become an obsession, meaning it's a thought that occupies this person, captivates this person's mind so much, they just believe it. I am good for nothing. It's an obsessive thought. They become obsessed with it. It occupies their whole thinking. And it could then lead to occupation, which is the enemy now establishes a stronghold in their mind in that area. I just want us to understand how this progresses spiritually. But the good news is God has given to us weapons, the weapons of our warfare. Second Corinthians 4, he says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. They are divine, divinely given, divinely empowered. The weapons God has given to us are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds can be pulled down. Are you listening? If you and I use the weapons that God has given to us, no matter what, has, what the enemy has built in our minds, these areas that are occupied, these, this fortress built of thoughts and ideas and imagination that are deceiving, destructive, if those things can be pulled down. And we can be free. We can clean up our minds. Are you listening? And sometimes, as believers... You know, we may have many different kinds of strongholds, deceiving thoughts that began as a thought, but now is you know, built, is, is an area in our minds that are occupied. And those strongholds need to be pulled down. And we can learn how to do it. So, looking at the instructions given to us in this passage, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, the actions required of us is this. Take every thought captive. The moment a wrong thought comes, you've got to arrest it. Take it captive. Stop it there. If it progresses into an argument or reason, you need to cast it down, demolish it. If it progresses into an imagination, in your mind, we need to cast it down. And in some cases, if it has become a stronghold, it's occupying our minds, we need to Pull it down. Pull down strongholds. But God has given you and me the weapons we need to make this happen. Amen? Are you happy? We're going to learn how to do it. And it'll work because it's God's word. It'll work. Our mind can change. So how do we do this? Now let's talk about the weapons. Very briefly I'll mention this. Uh, we've seen this already. But it's good to just remind ourselves, four, four, four weapons I'll mention. The spoken word of God. The word of God needs to be spoken. And we saw this, you know, how Jesus himself, when he was tempted, when he had wrong thoughts and ideas presented to him by the devil, he always responded, it is written. He said what the Bible says. Second weapon that we have, that we, we must use, is the authority of Jesus' name. We say it in Jesus' name. Because when you and I as believers use the name of Jesus, it puts us in a place of authority and dominion over what the devil is doing. And as a believer, you have the right to use the name of Jesus. So you say, in Jesus' name. Third weapon, the blood of Jesus. When we say what the blood of Jesus has done for us, it's 
our weapon against the enemy. We said earlier, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So the blood of Jesus is powerful because it reminds the devil that every claim he had over us is annulled. The payment has been made. The blood of Jesus Christ, the payment is ma- has been made. No more claims over you and me. It's the ransom that was paid for our redemption. So the blood of Jesus is so powerful. You're reminding the devil everything is paid. No more charges. No more claims. And then Praise and worship, fourth weapon. Praise and worship. Just you and I praising God. In Psalm 8 and verse 2, the psalmist said, two things happen when we praise God. It secures us. That word strength there, your ordained strength, is is actually the, the word meaning of that word is fortress. So when you praise God, it secures you. And he also uses the word, it stops the enemy. So when you praise God, you are securing yourself and you're stopping the enemy. Just praising God, saying, God, I praise you. You say, but I don't feel like it. It's okay. It's not about your feeling. It's about who God is. Just you saying, God, you are good. You may not feel very good at that time. You may not feel very excited at that time. But you say, God, you are good. God, you are merciful. Whatever, you know, just praise him for any attribute of who he is. Praise him. So simple, four simple weapons. Use the word of God, the name of Jesus, the blood. Declare what the blood has done for you and praise God. So let's take an example. Suppose a thought of fear comes into our mind. A fear, thought of fear. Example, fear of the future. Um, The thought comes, what's going to happen to your future? Nothing there. Can't even see anything. Future is dark. No promise, no hope. You might even lose your job or this or that. You know, those, those thoughts. What should we do as a believer? The moment that thought of fear comes. Remember, fear is not of God. God speaks peace to his people. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So what must we do? The moment that thought comes. Do you want that thought of fear in your mind? Do you want that thought of fear to torment you? The Bible says fear has torment. People are tormented, troubled, disturbed, agitated. They have anxiety attacks, all kinds of things because of fear. Do you want to be in that state? No. What must we do? The moment the thought comes, take it captive because fear has torment. You don't want that torment in in you. So first thing, take every thought captive. How? Using the weapons. What is the weapon? The word of God. So the moment this thought of fear concerning your future comes to your mind, you say no. And you can use any one of these scriptures. I'm just, I might just mention a few. Jeremiah 29, 11, God said. So you just say it. Don't worry about which version, whether it's King James, whatever. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Just say it. Say it in your own words. It doesn't have to be an exact word-for-word quote from the Bible. Just say it. My God knows the plans he has for me. Plans of prosperity. Plans to give me a future and a hope. What are you doing? That moment, you're taking that thought captive. Amen? With the word of God, say what God said. Or if you know Psalm 23, most of us have learned it as children. I, though, yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for the Lord is with me. So that thought of fear is very real. Comes to a man. And it has torment. It's affecting us. But what must we do? Take that thought captive. That moment. Counter it with the word of God. And then you say, in Jesus' name, I reject this thought of fear. Then take a moment to praise God. Father, I thank you. You are such a good God. You have journeyed with me all these years. Lord, I thank you. My future is secure. My times are in your hands, God. Praise God. Say a few words of praise. You don't have to have music all the time. Just say a few words. Your praise secures you and your praise stops the enemy. Are you listening? So that thought of fear, you, must, you and I must, must capture every thought. But suppose we don't do that. That thought now becomes an argument in our minds. It's not becoming a reasoning. It's arguing against God. Ah, Look at John. John believed in God, but see what happened to him. And look at Mary. 
Mary believed in Jesus. See what happened to her. And look at Job. Joe believed in God. So uh, it, now it's, argue, it's an argument trying to disprove the word of God. And you need to say, I'm not Joe, Mary, or Joe, or John. I believe the word of God. I can't judge what happened in their lives. I don't know. I can only speak for myself. I believe what God said. It's between God and me. Right? So even now, if it has progressed to an argument in a reasoning, you need to cast down the argument. Same weapons do the same thing. Or if, I, if it progresses to an imagination. No, you are Im it becomes an imagination in your mind. You're seeing yourself out on the streets. Homeless. It's, it's, it's so terrifying. You know, our imagination can play on us, on our emotions. Right? So all this imagination becomes very vivid, almost real life, just that it's happening in the mind. And that thought that came, that thought of fear, has now become an argument, and now it has progressed to an imagination in your mind. And it's, you're beginning to see all these things. The Bible says you have to cast down imagination. You have to say no. Again, same thing. Use the word of God. Use the name of Jesus. Praise God at that moment. But it's a little harder now because it has progressed now to an imagination. It's, it's, it's occupying your mind. But now, if we have not stopped it at that point of imagination, and we keep entertaining series of thoughts and ideas and arguments, it's going to become a stronghold. It's going to be an area in our mind that has been occupied by this wrong idea that your future is bleak, that your future is hopeless, uh, it can lead to depression and all the wrong things. It's become a stronghold. But we can pull down strongholds. Same weapons. But it's going to require a little bit more work because you've got many more bricks to pull down. Are you understanding? But it can be done. Same way. We have to speak the word. Praise God. Use the name of Jesus. Declare what the blood of Jesus has done for you and me. Now, the Bible talks about us wearing the helmet of salvation. In Ephesians 6, 13 to 17, as the Apostle Paul describes uh, the armor we are supposed to wear, he says, put on the helmet of salvation, your headgear. Now, if you don't have the helmet, it's very easy for the enemy to decapitate. But the helmet protects our mind. I'm talking about in the context of what Paul said. Protects this area. And what is the helmet? He says, put on the helmet of salvation. That means we need to be fully informed and fully um, committed, understanding what our salvation is. That's of a helmet. It protects the area of our mind to know what salvation God has given to us. Now, sometimes we think salvation is only me going to heaven. That's only one part of it. But salvation is, is, is comprehensive. It means you are a child of God. It means Satan has no authority over you. It means you are redeemed. You're delivered. You're healed. You're blessed. You're victorious. You are in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you. All that is part of salvation. And you need, to know, you need to be firmly established because that's what's going to secure our minds. Put on the helmet of salvation. Know what your salvation is all about. And the God of our minds. Put on the helmet of salvation. So, getting ready to close. Worship team, please come. What must we do? Take action in the mind. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Peter writes, he says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your minds. And I said, well, what is that? Gird up the loins. So please use your imagination with me. Those of us, you know, and uh, we know people, sometimes we see people wearing dhotis, lungis. Now, when it is let down, you can walk, but you can't run. If you want to run, you 
got to put it up, <laughs> tuck it in, you can run. That's girding up the lines. Gird up the lines. That means get ready for action. What is he saying? Gird up the lines of your mind. You're not going to forget this ever. <laughs> Gird up the loins of your mind, meaning get ready to take action in your minds. That means don't be passive in your mind and just receive what comes in. No, your mind is yours. You are in charge of your mind. God gave your mind to you, not to somebody else. So you take action in your minds. You decide what you want to go on in your mind. When a thought comes, you can choose to take that thought captive. You can choose to cast down arguments and reasonings. You can choose to cast down wrong imaginations. And you can choose to pull down strongholds that you know it's not supposed to be there. You gird up the loins of your mind. Take action in your minds. See, sometimes in certain ideas and philosophies, they say, keep your mind blank. An empty mind is the devil's. Well, it's not Bible. It's just a saying. <laughs> but the point is, if you keep your mind blank, you're just accommodating, you're just inviting all the wrong thoughts. The Bible says take action in your mind. Don't keep your mind blank. Don't be passive. Take action in your mind. So you and I must do it. And God has given us the tools or the weapons to do it. Take action in your minds. Two areas that we need to take action in our mind. One is against the fiery darts of the enemy. So there is the devil who throws wrong thoughts, ideas, imaginations, trying to weaken us and so on. That's one source of wrong thoughts. We need to take action against it. The devil will lie to you. You're going to fail. The devil will lie to you. You will never succeed in life. You can never amount to anything. God hates you. God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about All those are lies. But if you don't stop those thoughts, it could progress into something. So take action in your mind. And the second area we take action against is what people say. Sometimes people tell us, the wrong things whether intentionally or unintentionally they might put you down they might demean you devalue you uh, say things that you don't need to they, they shouldn't be saying and, and if those wrong thoughts I'm not saying don't listen to anybody we, we of course have to listen but I'm, uh, learn from each other but if people are speaking the wrong thing you need to determine filter that and say no I'm not accepting that so we are open-minded, but don't be so open-minded that your mind becomes a garbage ground. You've got to filter. I don't want those things. I'll accept the right things, but wrong things, no. So take action against the fiery darts of the enemy. Take action against what people say. Your mind is yours. God wants us to take action in our mind. Now I've tried to put this into a little acronym called CARE. CARE FOR YOUR MIND. How do you do that? C. CAST DOWN. CARE. So remember that. Just simple word CARE. I had to care for my mind. C. CAST DOWN. These thoughts, imaginations that are not good, that are not wholesome. CAST IT DOWN with the Word of God. A. Arrest. Take captive. You're in charge. You can decide what you want in your mind, what you don't want. You arrest the thought. Say, sorry, not going to play in my mind. You're arrested, sending you out. Arrest your, those thoughts. Replace wrong thoughts and ideas with the Word of God. Sometimes we have, we may have mistakenly accepted something, but now replace it. Replace wrong thoughts and ideas with the word of God, with the truth of the word. Expel demonic spirits and influences. So even the enemy wants to intrude into our thinking, our thought process. 
but you expel it. Say, I'm not going to give this wrong thought, wrong idea, any place in my mind. Expel. So simple. Care. Cast down, arrest, replace, expel. Strongholds, like we said, needs a little bit of more work. I'll just outline this. This will be in a book. We are putting all this thing into a book. So hopefully before the series is over, you'll have it with you. I'll just quickly mention it. In order to deal with strongholds, first we need to repent. Repent, Repentance is a change in our thinking. So say, God, I'm sorry I let this thing occupy my mind. And today I realize it's not, shouldn't be there. So repent, submit that area to God. Reject every demonic spirit that may have gained entrance. Renounce any activity that has entertained this kind of thinking. Sometimes, you know, a person who's an example into pornography and his mind is occupied by that, he needs to renounce those, those, those wrong things. And then brick by brick, remove every brick with the word of God. So, today, I want us to understand we need to control our thoughts. We need to train our thinking. Take every thought captive. Cast down arguments, reasonings that are not right. Cast down imaginations and pull down strongholds. Use the word of God, the name of Jesus, the blood of Christ, and praise to our God. Use it. Take action in your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Take action. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. We pray. Before we take a moment to sing, and then we will close shortly after that. There's anyone here this morning, people watching online, if you've never received Jesus Christ into your life, you know, we, the, the Bible is wonderful, has answers for so many areas of our lives, and we're just talking right now about the mind, and we're learning from the Bible what God wants us to do with our minds. And that's good, but there's something more important, or I should say very important. It's our relationship with God. Jesus Christ came. He died for our sins on the cross. He was buried. He rose up again. He's alive today. And he did all that to bring you and me into a relationship with God. That's the most important thing. To have our sins forgiven. For you and me to become children of God. He came to do that. And the Bible says, whoever believes in him, to them he gives the power to become the children of God. And that is entirely your choice. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can force it on you. But you can make the choice to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, whoever believes in him, to them he gives them the power to become God's children. So I want to extend that invitation to any one of us here. If you've never done that in your life before, and you feel you want to do it, those of you watching online, if you feel that you want to do it today, I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. Anybody you feel in your heart you want to do it, just join with me in this prayer. To ask Jesus to forgive your sins, to come into your life and make you a child of God. If you feel you want to do it in your heart, just join me in this prayer. You can say this with me if you've never done this before. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe you died for my sins on the cross. I believe you're alive today. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins and make me a child of God. And help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've never done this before and you did this for the first time with me today, 
We want to celebrate with you. So if you don't mind, could you raise your hand? Anybody in this auditorium? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. I don't see your hand. Don't embarrass you. Just, just wave at me. Anybody prayed this with me for the first time? Anyone here? Okay. I don't see any hands. Uh, if there's anyone watching online, if you did this for the first time, just type in the chat or do whatever you can or get in touch with us through our church website. You can go to the same page, apcwo.org slash ftv. Just tell us that you prayed this prayer for the very first time. We're going to sing for a few moments that I'll pray and then we will dismiss right after that. God bless. Father, we just thank you for your word. That your word is truth. Your word is power. Your word is light. And your word will never return to your word. And God, let your word bear much fruit in each of our lives. Strengthening us, enabling us to do what we've heard. 
to take every thought captive to cast down arguments reasonings that are against the knowledge of God and casting their imaginations and pulling down strongholds may each one of us God experience your word at work in us transforming our minds making it clear healthy strong so that as people we can serve you well we can serve you with our with the abilities that you've given us in our minds we can put it to work and use it for your glory god may each one of us experience the working of your word and your spirit thank you may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god our heavenly father and the sweet fellowship of his holy spirit continue with each of us always in jesus name amen amen thank you for listening we trust this message was a blessing to you for more free resources including sermons sermon notes and books please visit apcw.org for information on apc bible college in bangalore visit apcbiblecollege.org do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.